So I've gone ahead and recorded. So welcome to Faves 8. I'm Jessica. I'm here with some exciting speakers. We have Gordon Smith from Fixed Phage, and we can spotlight him. And he's going to be our <laughs> first speaker. Hi. Surprise. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And then we have Chloe Jane, her Jones, and she is here and she's from Selexis. So this is a new kind of way of doing things for faves. We have a sponsor this for this week, and this is Selexis. So they make the cell maker, which we should be calling the phage maker because it makes phages really well. So mm -hmm. that's the focus of today's talk is about how Gordon and his team at Fixed Phage have been, well, we'll hear about what they do as a company. They're working on immobilizing phages onto surfaces um, for various applications. And then we're gonna have um, Chloe give a talk, uh, well, Gordon's going to talk about how they've also been able to increase their phage production through using the cell maker. Um, and then uh, Chloe's going to give a talk about how a little bit more about details about how the cell maker works. And so we're excited as phage directory to support companies that are doing phage work in all kinds and supporting phage work. So we want to help everyone make phages more efficiently. So that's why we're excited to partner with Selexis to kind of bring you guys um, some information about how it might work, how it might be able to work for you. And then you can also ask them questions about it too. So uh, it'll be a similar format to usual. We'll have about 20 to 25 minutes of um, presentations and then we'll have a combined Q&A with the two speakers. And then we're gonna do breakout rooms. Um, so if you haven't been here before, there are about 10 minutes and we'll be randomizing you into sh small groups. And just to let you know that the breakout rooms aren't recorded so you can feel free to be yourself. Um, that will be just meet and greet, meet a new couple friends in the phage world and see who you get matched with. Um, yeah, and so depending on how much time we have after questions, sometimes we do one breakout room two. who knows how many um, we'll get to. It's nice that they're modular. <laughs> so anytime you have technical issues, just use the chat and Jan will be uh, monitoring that. So like, I can't hear you or unmute somebody, but we'll be monitoring that. So without further ado, I'm going to give it over to Gordon and uh, he's going to take it away. Thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you, Jan, and for inviting me to speak to you all today. And good afternoon, good uh, from Scotland. Good morning for everyone in the States, and good evening for um, everyone else. Um, so, as Jessica said, my name's uh, Gordon Smith. Um, I've been a member of Fixed Phage, which is a startup company based in Glasgow, in Scotland, for about nine years now. Um, I want to talk to you, everyone of today about a bit about the company, a bit about what we do, the challenges we face, and then sort of tie into our experience with the Selexis cell maker and uh, you know, why it was um, a good choice for us and why we've taken up and the success we've had with it. So, clicks, there we go. So who are Fixed Phage? Um, for all those that haven't heard of us, we are what's called a bacterial phage immobilization company. So a lot like the rest of you, we isolate and characterize bacterial phages. Um, we have, we find the kind of problems that bacteria are causing in many fields, and we we suggest phages to people that are when they're looking for a specific bacteria they want taken out. Um, but the, the difference is that we have um, a patented technology which is called plasma mediated immobilization. Uh, the story behind that is it used to be called Corona Discharge, but for obvious reasons we've had a bit of a rebrand um, on the name of that product, so we changed to plasma mediated immobilization. Um, and this allows us to make targeted natural antimicrobial products. And I'll explain a bit about that. So what is plasma mediated immobilization, PMI? So basically what happens is, if you can see my pointer, is you have an electrode which produces an electrical discharge and a plasma discharge. And it basically has the effect of treating a surface when the surface passes through it. So this removes a kind of layer of chemical groups and that makes them free to grab onto something else. So to stick things onto the surface, um, like a bacteriophage. Um, I always tell people that everyone has probably had experience with corona discharge in this process. Um, if you've ever been to the supermarket and you've got one of their supermarket branded plastic bags, you will notice that there's a label, there's sometimes a label with the supermarket branding on. And if you try to remove that label from the bag, it's pretty impossible. You'd have to basically destroy the bag. And um, this is basically, this ink is stuck on with corona discharge. And so it's the same application for phages that 
that impossible to remove label is what happens to the bacteriophages. So this results in the immobilization of the bacteriophage to the surface of the material. Um, and it's a very flexible process. A lot of materials can uh, go through this process and have bacteriophages immobilized on. And I'll be going into some of that in the talk. So the materials, as we see from this diagram, have active bacteriophages fixed on them. So this little schematic of a bacteriophage, um, you can see it covering this um, little material, whether it be a bead, sheet, fabric, um, feed. And you see that the bacteriophages are stuck to the surface and ready to infect any bacteria. What we found um, by coincidence is that this immobilization process not only provides targeted antimicrobial surfaces, but allows the bacteriophages to withstand some external stressors such as pH, a higher temperature, um, and really increases their shelf life. So, as I said, the result is, is that resilient bacteriophages can then be directly applied to the desired state where you want your bacteria taken out. So this is a picture of one of our machines. So this is just the flexibility of the technique. Um, this is a plastic sheet that's going through. Um, it's one of our plastic has been um, quite a popular uh, substrate that we've immobilized phages onto. Um, this purple line you can see here is the corona discharge process. So you can see that the plastic will go through that and it'll come out looking exactly the same, just that the surface will have more wettability and more surface groups for phages to bind onto. Um, this is just another machine that we've recently um, patented and installed, and this is a belt-fed corona machine. Uh, one of the popular applications we've had for technology is with animal feeds. Um, so I've just put some picture of some fish feed here. So the fish feed again goes through that electrical discharge. We put our phages, apply our phages on, and the phages immobilize onto the feed. Um, it doesn't change the nutritional content of the food, and we find that the you know, animals grow to the same weight as if they're fed non-immobilized feed. Um, and this allows, obviously, the bacteriophages to access parts um, of the animal um, where, they, where they might get a bacterial infection. So this is just some demonstrations of the technology at work and just some of the surfaces that we've worked with. Um, these are some plastic, and you can see that the uh, clear surface around the plastic is the antimicrobial activity from the phages. Um, again, it's that plastic. This is some wound dressing, and so you can see different phages have been applied. Um, and you can see the kind of different zones of clearing around the wound dressing, showing that there's active phage. And lastly, these is, this is a um, cellulose powder, so we can also work with different powders. Um, as an application, you can see again the antimicrobial activity around that. Um, in terms of data set, in terms of shelf life, we find that immobilization dramatically increases shelf life of some phages. Um, this was an aquaculture phage. We immobilized it onto some feet, some animal feet. We stored it at 30 degrees and we measured it over, we actually have a longer graph than this, and we measured it over a period of about 40 days. Um, and you can see that with the free phage immobilized onto the feet um, without at the higher temperature, which is not an optimum phage storage temperature, and without any moisture, it soon dies off and you don't see any activity. Immobilized phage, it seems to be different. We see kind of continuous activity with just a slight drop um, after about the two week mark. Um, this is just another example of the technology at work. Um, this is on uh, spinach. So we've undertook a small scale study with um, spinach where we immobilized, we isolated some bacteria that were that caused spin that had been implicated in spinach spoilage, isolated the phages, immobilized those onto an insert, which we put into the spinach bag. We then, um, then took looked at the spinach every day and assessed it visually um, using a scoring system that we took from the literature. And we found that when you have the immobilized phage inserts, that the spinach is uh, fresher for about a day longer. So we had this cutoff mark where the spinach had been beyond, it's beyond edible, um, you wouldn't be buying it. And we saw that we noticed the immobilized phage added at least about a day before it went below that threshold. Um, so it's a very, it's a very promising, very um, flexible, very, um, sorry, very good technology that seems to have applications in a lot of fields. Um, we've just started the kind of rebranding and just to highlight some of the areas that we're working and some of the fields that we're planning to move into. Um, Medifix and safe fix for the kind of more human health aspect. Um, Agrifix for agriculture and I believe that and agriculture and farming and crops. Um, pet fix for your, the pet food mar pet market, which is a very lucrative one. Um, fresh fix for the kind of um, vegetables and salads. 
farm fix with lots of cover agriculture and aquafix for agriculture. So just to get a show of the flexibility of the technology and where we can apply it. So the thing about fixed phage, it's a very promising technology, very flexible. The problem we have is that we're very small. We are a start, we are basically a startup. We've gone from, so I used to say we're a spin out, but we've spun out and we're now at the very much the kind of small enterprise stage. Um, we have three small buildings and we've got a lot of projects that we want to cover. And traditionally, we've been working on a kind of proof of concept model where we immobilize small amounts of bacteriophage, send it out for external testing or try and apply it in small settings. And we've relied on small scale bacteriophage production for this. So, you know, so just to kind of give you the idea of the numbers we had, we had about, you know, with 250 mil, 250 mil flasks, we got a concentration of about 1 to 10 to 9 platform units per mil. So that's kind of our biggest production process um, before the Selexis came in. Um, that's okay for small scale. Um, and with the plate method, so growing the phage up into an agar plate, pouring in our, our buffer and then filtering out, and then you get about you know, 100 mils at one time into the tent. So the concentration goes up, but the volumes are really, really small for what we want to use it for. Um, one day fixed phage will be looking to expand into the manufacturing and large scale production. And we really need to be doing more than 250 mils of phage for all these projects um, and for all the markets we want to enter. So then comes fermentation. So we had thought about this and we had been looking at some uh, setups. So I've got quite a gross picture, frankly, of um, our old fermenter. Um, where it was a glass vessel, traditional glass vessel with all the plastic tubing, um, very complicated. There are many, many parts that all had to be controlled. And uh, yeah, there we go. And it's yeah, very difficult to control, making sure everything's all right, making sure everything's at the optimum, it's in the right place and in the optimum play, place. Um, we use a temperature jacket, so we didn't really have any much temperature control, um, kind of relying on a bit of um, the flexibility of the bugs and working on easy to grow bacteria and more, more robust bacteria. Um, contamination was an issue, obviously. These things are very hard to clean and sterilize. We've got a traditional, you know, we've got also with being a small place, we, our autoclaving facilities are quite small, so it's hard to fit one of these in. Um, the rubber tubing has its own problems with sterilization and decontamination. And we found that we were getting some contamination issues. And with phages being so specific, as you all know, that's something we really don't want to be adding to our system. We don't want a bacteria that will outgrow the ones that have been killed by the phage or it will just ruin our product. So and this is where the Selexis fermenter came in. So um, we've been in discussion with Selexis for, and we were kind of convinced from day one that this is what we'd be looking for. Um, that's the kind of size of our lab you can see in the faded background. Um, you can see that we don't really have the room for large scale uh, fermentation facilities. Um, when we were presented with the idea of the Selexis fermenter, the fact that it's, it's quite compact, it's very it's simple to set up, simple to use. It's got the kind of reusable bag, uh, the sterilize the disposable bags. Um, it just really ticked all the boxes that we were looking for in a fermenter for a company our size. Um, so easy to use. Um, it was very easy to use. In fact, Emma's put an animation in as well to show how easy it was to use. Um, we managed to set this up ourselves and do a few runs. Um, because of the bags, and the disposable bags, but there's no need for cleaning or autocleaning. That's a big advantage for us at the moment while we've got the limited facilities. Um, it's a very simple interface. It's um, our, we, didn't, we would, wouldn't really, we didn't really have an interface for our last um, fermentation equipment. Um, this one is a very simple, easy to use computer program, which allows you to control the temperature, the air movement, um, everything, you know, control, have a lot of control with a very easy to use system. Um, easy control, yeah. So, we managed to do two times eight litre bags in one run, and that's been really allowed us to kind of approach more people and approach more companies and have and allow us to produce phages for some of the large or scale trials that they want to do. And we've had some fantastic results with it. We've um, managed to increase our phage production to about one times 10 to 13 platform units per mil. So we've been focused on phage T4 um, for our optimization, just to try the machine out. Um, so T4, a pretty easy to grow, a large burst size phage. Um, we're very impressed at the kind of three log difference in production, the fact that we could get 16 litres of 1 to 10 to 13 phage. Um, that would have been enough. If I'd had this two years ago, that would have been enough for the whole, <laughs> whole life of the company. Um, but it's really the kind of numbers and volumes that we're looking for when we're moving forward. Um, yeah, we have even Amazon underlined that as well. 
Um, so this is the advantage of the Selexus machine. We Just to summarize, we were a small company that really needed to quickly upscale. We didn't have the autoclaving facilities and we prefer something that was easy to manage and easy to set up. And we were looking to kind of increase our production for some large scale trials that we were doing. And the Selexa cell maker just really ticked all these boxes. Um, we got an increased phage yield. Um, it was easy to set up. We could just sit and leave it because we could set it on the interface. And without needing to autoclave and using the uh, disposal bags, it really cuts out, um, cuts out any contamination. And this will be important for us as we move into more practices that require more stringent, um, stringent manufacturing processes, um, including the medical field. So um, I'm not sure what I've got to say. If, um, I'll pass you on to Chloe now, who's going to give you a bit more information about the Selexa cell maker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon. Awesome. Chloe, I'll let you get set up with your screen. Let me know if you yep. have issues. We've got some questions already coming in, but we're going to answer them at the end of Chloe's talk. So awesome. We have applause coming in. <laughs> Oh, not from the end. Sorry. <laughs> You'll get a sneak preview. No problem. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, that's where <laughs> Gordon left us off. Thanks very much for that intro. Um, all right. So, um, yep, I'm Chloe. I'm a business development manager at Selexis. And as you heard from Gordon, we manufacture the cell maker. So uh, following his wonderful presentation, thanks very much, by the way, I will just be taking a little bit more time to talk about our system um, and how we can help you guys optimize your phage amplification when you're scaling up. So, um, you know, if you're amplifying small amounts of phages, chances are you are probably using flask. Gordon went into this a little bit with their experience um, using flasks at fixed phage, but we're all familiar with the method. Um, so, of course, there are multiple ways um, and different production methods when you're scaling up, but flasks are great for starting out. You know, they're cheap and they work and they do produce stage products, um, but there's just some inherent drawbacks that kind of contribute to low and especially inconsistent figures. So when we're talking about the challenges of producing phage, um, a main one that comes to mind is just the lack of batch to batch reproducibility. So this can be because of a few different factors, um, such as lack of pristine control of optimal parameters. And then especially, you know, if you are using flasks, things such as temperature and gas exchange, they're really difficult to control effectively. Um, and then in addition, there's always that risk of contamination and that you're gonna have with any kind of reusable production platform. On top of this, scaling up can really be an issue. Again, especially if you're working with flasks, um, you know, you can't really scale up, you have to scale out at some point. Um, so instead of, yeah, scaling up, you know, you just have to have more flasks, which is a lot more work for you. And then depending on your lab setup, you also have the cleaning, sterilization between batches, increases labor and also the time in between batches. Um, so, you know, all in all, there's just some significant hurdles that we need to consider when evaluating a production platform. So maybe you find yourself in a similar situation to fixed stage, the time's come, you've reached your limit with your current platform and you want to level up your production. So the three main things that you wanna focus on are reducing contamination, controlling the environment, and having a solution with efficient volumes. Um, we do believe that the cell maker ticks all of these three off. So I'll go into a little bit more depth um, about how we do that. First point, contamination reduction. Um, so we all know that the more times you repeat an action, the higher chance there's going to be for contamination, which obviously leads to issues with scaling up. In addition, we're storing these flasks in incubators, which makes it really difficult to maintain sterility. You're constantly opening up, closing the door, taking a sample out, putting them back. Um, and then on top of that, if one of your flasks is contaminated, there's a good chance that it's not the only one. We all know how easily contamination can spread throughout an incubator. So as a response to that, single-use technology has really gained widespread popularity in the bioprocessing world lately. 
to combat these issues. So we wanted to make sure that we were providing a solution that utilized single use technology. Moving on to point number two, environmental control. You want your solution to have a high degree of control of various parameters such as temperature and gas exchange. Um, this is gonna be essential when optimizing your processes as it's gonna be helpful to kind of have a record of what you changed and what parameters you followed um, and how that impacted your results. And to go even one step farther than this, um, a system with automation ensures that the same exact conditions can, reproduce, can be reproduced um, batch to batch to batch. So the goal here is consistency. Going off of that leads me to point number three, which is volume efficiency. So let's say we're amplifying phages and three flasks process may require to grow bacteria to OD of 0 0.6, but by the time that we sample all of them, we might find they're growing at slightly different rates. So we inoculate as close to 0 0.6 as we can get, but some might be overshot a little, some might be undershot a little um, at the time of inoculation. And then there's the actual inoculation, you know, how much did you add? What time did you add it? We're only human and there is always room for handling error. So even though this is likely to be a really small variation, coupled with the difference in OD from flask to flask, it actually could have quite an impact on the phage to host ratio, which of course then in turn influences the final titer that you end up with. So we like to think that we're following a protocol and we're doing the exact same thing every time, but I'm sure all of you guys have experienced doing the exact same process for two flasks and ending up with a completely different titer. And at that point, it's just, a guessing game of where you went wrong and where the variation occurred. And this is just three flasks. So imagine that we're scaling up to eight liters. We have one liter flasks. We need to do this eight times. And then of course, probably two of them are gonna get contaminated anyway. <laughs> so to make our lives easier, um, we should be looking for a solution with more efficient volumes be produced in one single patch. So that means one OD value, one inoculating time and one final titer. So this is kind of the basis of what we're thinking at Selects. We use disposable single use bioreactive bags and we couple that with airlift technology. So this means that we only, oops, let me go back. Um, this means that we only use gas bubbles for mixing and agitation. So there's actually no moving parts, um, which is great in terms of maintenance as well. We're currently the only bioreactor on the market that are combining these two elements. Um, and we've found quite serendipitously, uh, actually, that phages respond really well to the airlift agitation. So this is what our enclosure system looks like. So this is what the um, plastic bag will be housed inside. It has integrated temperature control by a Peltier plate at the very back. Um, which is super accurate from 16 to 42 degrees within um, 0 0.1 of a degree. So like Gordon said, there's no need for any kind of jacketed reactor at all. Airflow is controlled by a mass flow controller. Bioreactors come sterile and double bagged, ready to use plug and play, um, which eliminates cross-contamination as well as eliminates cleaning and sterilization, which Gordon mentioned can be a bit of a headache. Um, so it's a domino effect here in terms of reducing downtime um, and it just frees up extra time for more value added tasks as a company. So as far as volumes go, um, we have two different sizes currently. On the left hand side there, that's the eight liter system. So that has working volumes from three liters all the way up to eight liters. And then on the right hand side is our 50 liter system and that has working volumes from 10 liters up to 50 liters. Um, a small thing to note about the 50 liter enclosure is that it is on wheels. That sounds like a really silly thing to point out, but it's actually really helpful, you know, if your downstream processing is in a different part of the lab, it's really mobile and easy to cart around. So here's a case study from Rob Levine's laboratory at KUL. So I met Professor Levine for the first time in Oxford at the Phages 2019 conference, and eventually we ran a demonstration at his lab. So we went there for three days, played around with the system, did a couple of runs with them. Um, they were producing phages against agrobacterium for a crop protection application, and they wanted to scale up their production. 
So we used five liters of LB broth um, and we inoculated that bacteria at 0.5 OD. Once it reached 0.2, we inoculated with the phages and the phage inoculum was five times 10 to the eight EFU per mil. So we stopped the run the following morning um, and the final lysate titer ended up being 1.25 times 10 to 10, um, resulting in an amplification factor of 6,250. Uh, but what's more notable here is that we got a lysate titer 12 and a half times higher than their usual glass production titer. And this was just the first run with the cell maker, so we haven't done any optimization yet. I know Gordon mentioned that um, at fixed stage without any optimization, they got 10 to the 13. So that's absolutely fantastic. Since then, Rob has decided to purchase the system and it was installed in his lab last month, actually. So the cell maker is also used in commercial production as well. Here is a picture of our systems at Proteon Pharmaceuticals in Poland. So they use the cell maker to produce their animal health products. If you guys are interested in learning more about that um, and what they're doing over there, we do have an application note about it that you can download from our website. And they currently have um, a, quite a few systems, actually. They have five eight liter systems and three 50 liter enclosures, and they're planning on growing that number. So um, this picture kind of shows you a typical setup of the system, what it looks like most people install it in their lab. Um, I know Gordon mentioned the small footprint, but here you can really like put the control unit underneath the bench and that eight liter enclosure fits very well on top of a bench. So it's great in terms of um, saving space. Uh, speaking of saving space, we also have recently launched our dual controller, meaning that you can um, control two enclosure units from the same control unit. So these can be the same process or two completely different processes running at the same time. Not only does it save you space, but it also saves you money because you know you don't need to buy a whole nother system to double up your production. So this is compatible with two eight liter enclosures, one eight, one fifty, or two 50 liter enclosures. So you have optimal flexibility here. And yeah, that's all I have. Um, just as kind of a wrap up, you know, manufacturing costs is key to the success or failure of a product. And so the significance of choosing the best technology for scaling up your process is super important, can't be underestimated. Um, and just throwing it out, if you guys aren't in the position to flat out purchase a system like this, we do offer really reasonably priced rental options. Um, so you kind of have a low risk way of trying it out and seeing for yourself how it works. So with that, I want to say thanks to Jessica for this great opportunity. Tell you guys a little bit more about what we do. Um, and thanks, Gordon, for talking about all the exciting things happening at Stage, explaining how the cell maker has helped you guys with your production. Um, and last but not least, thanks to all of you guys for tuning in and giving me a little chunk of your Tuesday. Awesome. Thank you, Chloe. Fantastic from both. So let's go straight into the questions. There's a bunch. So, um, and maybe Jan, if you're there, you can make them both spotlit. Uh, that might help. Um, or we can keep it on speaker spotlight. Great. Okay. So um, we have one from Ben Burroughs. Gordon, are the phages immobilized in random orientation? And Anna Dragos also had the same question. So if it's not random, how do you make sure they're oriented spikes up? Yeah, uh, thank you both for your question. Um, this one we get asked a lot. Uh, in my diagram, I had the perfect world where all the phages are pointing up and ready to go. But mm -hmm. in reality, that's, that's not what happens. So what's important for us to do is to measure the surface activity of any material that we send out. Um, this will take into account how much active phage that we'll have in our material rather than just every phage that's on there. Surface activity, is that what you said? Yeah. Essentially, yeah, yeah, measuring, yeah, measuring the surface. So we developed a few assays in-house that allow us to um, measure the surface activity. And then that shows us how many phages and what dose will be going to the animal or product. Interesting. Cool. Thank you. Um, Atif says, did you test the mobilized phage in a natural environment with high velocity flow of water? 
No, thank you, Atif. No, we haven't done the high velocity flow of water. And um, that's interesting. What I will say for, um, I'm going to cheat and put the question in two halves. Um, again, one of the more important things we want to do is test our products in the natural environment. So once we've developed and showed the product works in the lab, we immediately set up a kind of pilot study or a small scale or large scale where we go into the environment where the technology will be deployed. Um, we know that phage, opt phage efficiency is dependent on the environment, what bacteria, receptors bacteria are producing. So it's really important that we test it and make sure the product works in the natural environment. Um, we haven't tried a high velocity flow of water yet. No, it's been an interesting one for some applications here. Yeah, um, and Panos has a question similar. Um, have you tried immobilizing them on metals like stainless steel or cast iron? Um, thank you, Panos. I don't believe we have, no. Um, we use stainless, um, it'd be interesting to see how that works because we need steel or metal for to provide a conduction surface for the electrodes. So I'd imagine it would work. It would just be a case of trying it. Um, I love I love whenever I do one of these talks, there's so many good ideas that come out from the scientists <laughs> <laughs> that watch it, um, uh, that watch or listen to the talks. So um, if you have any specific application, um, yeah, it'd be good to get in touch with some people and uh, we can explore it. Awesome. Yeah. And a reminder to everyone that we share the chat with speakers. So if we don't get to your question, I'll still be passing this on to Gordon and you can he can know if, if you're interested in talking and we can help you get in touch after. Um, OK, so another one Atif says, is it possible to immobilize phages in a way that their release can be controlled? Yes, yeah, this, this is another very interesting idea um, from the chat. We. And one application we were, um, one of the concepts we may have came up with is mobilizing onto sort of dissolvable material, which would then dissolve at a certain rate that we would uh, know and manage and make sure you have kind of free phages in the solution. Um, this isn't something we've tried yet though, so it's, uh, it's another very interesting idea. Thank you. Yeah, super cool. Okay, we have one from Michael Shamash. Thanks for uh, both for your talks. Chloe, um, is the air inputted into the bioreactor actual air, like O2 nitrogen mix, or can this be any gas that the user desires? Is thinking specifically of anaerobes, which prefer nitrogen rich environments with some hydrogen as well? Thanks. Yeah, um, good question. So, no, we can use any kind of gas that um, you guys need. There's or different gas inputs at um, the back of the control unit. Usually, you know, we say oxygen, nitrogen, CO2, and air are the most common. If you're just using air, we have um, a um, air compressor built into the control unit. So you don't need anything else. But if you're using nitrogen, oxygen, you just need to hook up a tank. Um, we had one guy use methane, which was a bit odd. I stayed far away from that one. Um, so yeah, you can really use whatever you need. Awesome. Very cool. Um, okay, this is why I'm, who is this for? So why does changing the mixing method from the usual incubator where RPM is controlled to airflow? Uh, oh, why does it affect the final titer? This is for um, potentially for Chloe. Do you know why? That is a great question. Um, and I would love to answer it. <laughs> I said, you know, that we kind of ran into the fact that um, it was really great for phage amplification quite serendipitously, which is the honest truth. Um, we just know that we're getting great results right now. I was talking to some people about it at um, the Phage Futures conference back in February. And there was some talks of like, maybe it affects the birth size or something. I, to be honest, I'm not quite sure, but it's an interesting question and we would love to find out more information about it. Cool. Um, Okay, awesome. So uh, this is for Chloe too. Um, besides the clear benefit in terms of bacterial growth rate and mixing times in the airlift reactor, are there other hypotheses about why? Okay, this might be a very similar one to the last. Have you compared the, oh, this is new. Have you compared the resistant mutant selection rates in your reactors versus flasks? So yeah, first question, similar to the last one, um, but you're right, you know, if we're able to grow have like optimal bacterial growth then obviously you're gonna end up with a better final titer um but the second question no we've not done any kind of comparison with resistant mutant selection but that is a interesting point and i will take note of that 
I'm curious, actually, because these two questions are about kind of doing these small research studies. Like, would you do you ever partner with labs that want to help you answer these kind of questions or do you do R&D in your in-house? Um, no, we don't actually do any R&D in-house. So, yeah, we're always interested to kind of partner with people and get more data for sure. Hmm. That would be definitely interesting. For interesting. Make note, anyone. Um, OK, <laughs> from Ron Dixon, has the does the maker have any mixing function? compared to the orbital shaker. I think we we got to this one and it's the airlift only, right? That's the mixing, that's the Correct. entirety of the mixing. Yeah, so there's no moving parts at all. It's just the gas bubbles. Super cool. Um, okay. And we also have another question about anaerobic bacteria, um, similar mm -hmm. to the other one about gas, but do you have any clients that are using it for anaerobes? Yeah, we do, yeah. So um, we're able to maintain an anaerobic condition inside awesome. if you just pump through nitrogen. Um, depending on how long your fermentation lasts, you might want to look into a nitrogen generator instead of just rolling through so many of these um, uh, tanks, but that's up to you guys. Got it. Awesome. Um, okay, Ron asks if you can give a very rough idea of pricing for the package. Yep million dollar question, isn't it? Um, no, we're very happy to share our prices. So if you guys want to email me afterwards, I'd be happy to get back to you. Awesome. Awesome. And we'll, we have another question about an email address from Gordon as well. So maybe if you guys don't mind sharing your email in the chat um, before oh, you yeah, go no today, that would help. Um, no problem. But people can always message me and ask for introduction if you can't find anyone's email address. Oh, uh, okay. And then we have just a couple questions left or maybe just one left. Um, is there a way to orient the tails? Yeah, we got this one about phage being oriented tails up. Oh, relying on the charge difference between the capsid and the tails and the phage particles. I seem to recall there was a paper by Hanny and Annie in which they did this. Gordon? Yeah, Stephen, that's a very interesting idea. Um, we've just started um, one of our uh, one of our lab workers on a PhD project who's looking at exactly things like this. Um, he's looking at a way to optimize and understand more our immobilization process. And one of the things he was looking at was putting in um, surface materials that would imp orient the phages and uh, obviously improve our immobilization process. So far, we've managed to get good results just with the random uh, the random mixing, but obviously as we move forward and we want to improve our efficiency, we'll definitely be looking at things like this. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, and I think that's, we're getting, we've completed, we answered all our questions. So that's awesome. Thanks so much for everyone for asking these questions. Thanks to the speakers. And I didn't mention in the beginning, I meant to, that Gordon stepped in at the last minute to cover for Emma. This is not Emma. <laughs> um, and we're really pleased that he was able to do that and give a presentation made by someone else is never the easiest thing, but he's also working closely with her and in doing all this with fixed phage. So we're very fortunate to have had Gordon and thank you so much for your talk. And thank you, Chloe, for giving the talk and for kind of coordinating this. It's been, really cool to just uh, work on this kind of other angle compared to what we usually talk about on the research side, but talking about like the nitty gritty of how are we as a field gonna cross this chasm and this bottleneck of manufacturing because it does come up a lot. And sometimes as a research student, I remember sometimes I found this stuff boring and now I'm like, how are we gonna do it? I need to know because this is kind of one of the keys that we see as blocking the phage field from advancing. So it's super exciting that there's companies that are focusing on this and like really making progress. So really excited um, to keep hearing updates on how everybody's uh, working with this system and all of your phage progress in general. So um, again, I'll look at all these nice thank yous for the talk. So you'll all be able to, the speakers will get these, um, the chat. So you'll be able to see. So thanks so much. I'm gonna stop the recording and then we're gonna get going with our breakup rooms.